The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. America's competitive culture has given rise to the most innovative and productive economy in the world. Why do Americans value competition so highly? And is there a downside to this push for excellence? To find out, Policy Watch is joined this week by Michael Barone, senior writer and editor of U.S. News and World Report, and the author of Hard America, Soft America, Competition versus Coddling. Now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besheroff. Michael Barone, welcome to Policy Watch. Nice to be with you. I mainly want to talk about your book, okay. Hard America, Soft America. Um, this is a great book, subtitled Competition versus Coddling. Well, it, let me define my terms. Uh, hard America is the part of American life, the parts of American life, where you have competition and accountability. Soft America is where you don't. So hard America includes, among other things, the high-tech private sector. Soft America includes, among other things, high school. The book stems from an observation I made a while ago that uh, it's, you know, 18, American 18-year-olds 18 seem to me to be in many ways more incompetent than 18-year-olds from other countries in the world. Certainly they score lower on tests. Uh, they do, as Bill Bennett's pointed out, score higher on self-esteem. Uh, but they score lower on tests than things like reading and math and history uh, than kids from many other countries. Um, and they don't really seem to be competent to do much of anything. And then American 30-year-olds are the most competent 30-year-olds in the world. I think it's because in, in many ways, um, and there's been some change in recent years, from ages 6 to 18, Americans tend to live in soft America, in particular the soft America that has been the, the case in the public schools, where, you have, where you've had a tradition of low degrees of accountability uh, and competition. And then from age 18 to 30, they find themselves suddenly in hard America. They're, it's the hard America of the competitive colleges and universities. It may be the hard America of the junior colleges, where uh, community colleges, where you see uh, Latinos especially are learning the things that the high school didn't bother to teach them, like how to read and write the English language in a standard way. Uh, you've got, um, uh, you, they learn it in the military. They learn it in the private sector, on the job. Uh, you know, some of the best job training is, jo is being on a job. Uh, and they encounter this hard America, and it turns out that it elicits from them this competition and accountability, all sorts of performance and competence um, that we really uh, didn't think them capable of. I mean, think of the military people that we've seen, and the media tends to concentrate on the bad news coming from Iraq, Afghanistan, and other fronts, um, but at least in the good news that they will occasionally give us, Look at the competence of these people in the military, and yet we know that a few years before, some of these young men and women were the sort of teenagers that most, that to outward appearances didn't seem to have much competence and, and, and ability at all, but uh, they've developed it. And uh, so hard America brings out, we don't want a society that's all hard or all soft. We want some soft niches, we want places for the helpless, we want raised children in an environment where they're not subjected to competition and so forth every minute of every day. It's a mixture and reasonable people will disagree on, at the margins on how much hardness and softness you want in a particular situation. Uh, but ultimately soft America lives off of hard America. It depends on hard America for um, economic growth uh, and potential for the creativity that we get in various uh, parts of American life and indeed for survival itself. Well, let's, let, let, you, you put, gave a little opening there. Let's talk a little bit about the parts of soft America that either we need or we should have or that you're not so worried about. Um, Social Security. Well, Social Security is part of the sort of welfare state project that we've had. And I begin my book at sort of looking through, uh, each chapter begins with a scene from a novel, uh, to sketch out what that part of America was like, taking a look at Theodore Dreiser's sister Carrie set in Chicago in 1900. And that looks a pretty hard America. If a girl didn't resort to immorality, uh, she'd better have a job or she was just not going to survive coming in, you know, into Chicago in that time. 
Uh, and as a reason, and that seemed to most Americans to be too hard in America. And we built up various welfare state uh, regulatory provisions, wages and hours laws in the states and things. Uh, Social Security, the, the idea of a safety net Those of are a bottom. Good uh, forms of soft America. Well, they're they're widely accepted, and, uh, You're and I th yeah, I think. I mean, I'm I'm not dissenting from the existence of the Social Security. I mean, we have questions about its financing in the future and so forth that are serious ones. But uh, yeah, that's that's accepted as a consensus in this society. We don't have as soft a welfare state as you get in continental Europe in the countries of Western Europe where we've really had an experiment over the last 25 years of uh, which system works better and is more productive. Uh, and the answer is in, and it's pretty clear, it's the United States. Um, where, where growth has been for the last 20 years, annual growth has been twice as large here. Yeah, as it's twice America. as large here, and we have generated in that time, what is it, something like 40 million net new jobs. Uh, in the United States. We did so in the 1980s when President Reagan was president. We did so in the 1990s when President uh, Clinton was president. We're doing so again today. Uh, president Bush is president. Uh, and Europe's net gain, Western Europe's net gain in jobs was zero over that same period of time. So that's a pretty compelling difference. Americans work harder. There's more, we work longer hours. We work, I would argue, more creatively and skillfully. Uh, and um, and we produced more. Now, there was a change. Um, we thought of it in a negative way, right, in the 70s and in the late 70s and the early 80s. We called it corporate downsizing. Uh, we deregulated and people lost jobs. That was, that was the beginning of more hard America, wasn't it? Well, it was the hardening of hard America. One of the things I found out uh, in writing this book, um, not all of the public sector is soft and not all of the private sector is hard. Um, there exist, you know, government agencies and organizations and government which, uh, which have hard traditions and judge themselves in, in tough and critical ways and perform very well. Such as? Such as some of our statistical bureaus in the federal government. Um, the Social Security Administration, I mean, you get your check on time. <laughs> Uh, performs, in, and there's an esprit within the Social Security Administration mm -hmm. of, of an awful lot of people that work there who say, we want to be part of this organization that really does an important job and we do it well. We really, you know, get those checks out, get the right amounts and so forth. But let me inter I'm sorry. Yeah. But there's no competition there. There's something else that makes the Social there's Security There's a tradition. Check. There's competition. There is ultimately competition through the political accountability and the electoral system. But, you know, organizations do build up character over time and can hold themselves to hard standards even when the marketplace doesn't do it. And similarly, if you look at the big corporations of the 1950s, the big three auto companies, for example, they were soft. Uh, you read William H. White's The Organization Man, a wonderful book. And he describes how they hired people according to how well they got along with each other. Did they fit in the organization group? And this was also, by the way, one of the reasons you had uh, racial and religious discrimination, because it was felt that black Americans, Jewish Americans, wouldn't mix in well with the corporate group, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't hire them. Um, so these organizations that depend on meeting consumer tastes, refuse to hire American Jews who have shown huge success in meeting consumer tastes in retail, uh, clothing, and show business. Um, uh, suicidal and foolish on the part of people running these corporations. But they thought, hey, we're one of the big three. Nobody can raise enough capital to compete against us. We're going to run this company like my dad did. No innovations. Just churn out the metal, and we'll make lots of money. And then came Toyota. Then came Toyota in competition. And they suddenly found out that, no, you don't live in soft America anymore. You live in hard America. And you can't just milk the consumer for more and more money. Uh, for higher wages for your workers and fatter salaries for the executives uh, by producing cars that will become obsolescent within two years and fall apart. People will not want to buy those after a while. And uh, the private sector hardened up. You had downsizing, you had uh, corporate takeovers, you know, which are generally written of as sort of raids by corporate, you know, pirates or something. Well, these are actually uh, the junk bonds uh, operations, new methods of financing. These, in fact, helped to create new organizations. They financed high-tech 
entrepreneurship and research and development. Uh, they meant that we efficiently used money without, you know, if we concentrated on just preserving all the jobs that existed at the beginning of 1979, we wouldn't have 40 million new jobs net but it's in America me today. It's messy, right? Um, 20, 30 years ago, when I first flew down to Florida to visit my mother, I paid $130 for a round trip, trip ticket. Last time I went, I also paid $130 for a round trip ticket. Divide by about four or four and well, a half, which is what the inflation Well, when you call long distance rate. calls and so forth, you begin to wonder why you don't call your mother more often. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so my, uh, the effective airfare to Florida is a third of what it was yeah. uh, 30 years ago. Long distance telephone rates a tenth of what they were. But it's also messy. Airlines are going broke all the time. Uh, it's not as if it's a pretty picture for the people who work for airlines. Uh, well, you know, capitalism, uh, uh, Joseph Schumpeter described it as uh, creative destruction. Uh, you know, there are alternatives. We saw one in Soviet Russia. Not very messy, unless you wanted to get decent food or something like that. Uh, a lot less messy. Um, you, you know, you have the welfare states in Western Europe. Uh, they don't have population growing as fast as the United States, and it's a good thing because they don't generate new jobs. Uh, less messy than the United States, although there is now airline competition in Europe now, and uh, to the point where, you know, airfares are lower than taking a cab to the airport you know, in some cases. Uh, now, unions are in soft America. Uh, well, unions exist in part to protect. Uh, their workers from certain kinds of competition, and of course, the industrial worker unions in the in the 30s made the argument that, uh, you know, in a time of scarce jobs, the management was requiring too much of workers. They were requiring them to work at speeds that were impossible to meet or unsafe. Uh, that you needed some protection against being arbitrarily fired and so forth. So they were an attempt to inject some softness uh, in a system that seemed to many people to be too hard. Um, you know, more difficult uh, than it could be. And, you know, that was an area where we had a lot of argument in American life. I mean, the, the unions are largely disappearing from private sector employment. Only about 8 percent of private sector workers are union members. About 40 percent of government employees are union members. So the union movement now is increasingly a movement of government employees. But there was vigorous argument for a long time in the political scene about the place of unions and to what extent they should be able to interpose some softness in relationship between management and workers. Are there any unions that you can think of that understand the distinction between hard and soft and have a balance that you might find well, more I think accommodating? That, I think probably over the years a lot of unions, of serious people in unions have given some thought to this. I mean, uh, you know, what do you you know, do you want uh, the fact that, you know, you can, you can kill the goose that laid the golden eggs? I mean, we saw that uh, to some extent. Um, well, in the auto industry in the 70s, um, Walter Ruther and Leonard Woodcock, UAW, were criticized for not getting uh, bigger contracts for the uh, workers after the 1970s strikes. I think they were vindicated in the subsequent decade when it was shown that those companies faced much more serious competition than they thought and that they just couldn't, um, you know, uh, pass along everything to the consumer and expect the consumer to keep buying the cars. Um, that started being a problem and I think um, those union leaders had some awareness, of this, some sophisticated awareness of that problem. We've been and I think about. people like Al, the late Albert Shanker, the American Federation of Teachers, had a sense that you want schools to produce excellence. Yes, he was in favor of tenure for teachers and for unions protecting people from jobs, but he also had a keen sense that there was a danger of protecting incompetent people and of not getting excellence out of a soft educational system. Yeah. Let's talk about that soft educational system. Why are the high schools soft and the colleges and community colleges harder? Well, for one reason, um, more competition. In the colleges and community colleges. They're competing uh, not only with each other but with other alternatives that people may have to use their time. They've got to attract people, whereas the model for the public high school that has been given to us over the years by the education schools and the teachers unions is a monopoly model. You know, if you live at 13,300 Arctic Avenue, you're going to go to this particular school and the kid doesn't get a choice. Um, so. 
uh, it's set up, uh, it was set up to be a soft system. Now, one of the things that we've seen over the last uh, 10 or 15 years is that a lot of uh, parents and others concerned about education uh, have been seeking other choices, and they've been getting those choices provided to them by a variety of mechanisms. Uh, school vouchers, which of course the teachers unions have, uh, you know, organized tremendously against. Charter schools, which can mean a wide variety of things, but does among other things uh, mean uh, competition. Uh, different elements of public school choice. You don't have to choose, if you live at this address, you don't, you're not bound to go to this school, you can apply for others. Uh, and the kind of accountability methods that we've seen in various states. Um, this, like welfare and crime control, are issues where the society has wanted to harden up a soft system and where the impetus originally came not so much from the center, not from Washington, D.C., not from uh, federal government, not largely from our great universities and so forth. It's come out from the periphery in various places. You know, in your comments you've been talking about, you talk, just talked about how the educational reform came from the periphery and we were making a distinction between American business or government uh, policy and European and so forth. Why do you suppose that at least some portions of America have hardened? And that's probably not the case in Europe. Uh, well, I th you know, part of it is different policy decisions and whole different sets of values. Americans are more inclined, you know, as Seymour Martin Lipset has shown over many years in his political science, Americans are more likely to value freedom and less likely to value uniformity. We're less likely to believe that it's unfair that people have unequal incomes. Uh, we're less likely to believe that government should do a lot to redress inequality of income. Uh, so we believe more in liberty and less in equality than they do as a general proposition. Uh, they're now, um, you know, trying to find out, uh, you know, if they can afford uh, their current system. Their current system. Uh, there was a recent headline in the Financial Times, the London-based newspaper, French workers strike to work longer hours. Uh, well, there's a new one. Uh, you know, France has had this law that says you can only work 35 hours a week, and then they wonder why production isn't high. Yeah. What is the almanac of American politics? Well, the Almanac of American Politics is a book of which I've been the principal co-author since uh, the first edition, which was published in 1971, uh, which tries to present in one volume a lot of the information you need to understand American politics uh, in each of the uh, 50 states, 435 congressional districts. We present a series of statistics, demographic statistics about the states and regions, voting statistics, uh, party registration where there is party registration, and about the elected um, officials of the country, the members of Congress, the Senate, the House, uh, a little bit on the president, vice president, the governors of each state, and um, I write also an introductory essay uh, and essays on each state and congressional district trying to explain their politics, perhaps setting it in some context of history um, and looking guardedly ahead to the future. And I think you have been in all 435 congressional districts? That's correct, yeah. Um, when I started doing this book, uh, after the first edition was published in 1971, I was taking a driving trip across the country and I said to myself, you know, I haven't been in a majority of congressional districts here. I am writing a book about them, describing them, and I don't know one part of Mississippi from the other, you know, at least by first-hand experience. Uh, so I just made it a project over the years to, when I was traveling around, to see that I touched all bases, all congressional districts in a particular metropolitan area, for example, and, uh, you know, it's useful to do that because one of the things uh, you do in political reporting and journalism generally, uh, an awful lot of it consists you land in an airport, you go stay at a fancy hotel somewhere, and you don't see very much else of the metro area. You don't have an idea about how the vast middle class, about how the poor and immigrants live, about you may know something about the very, how, where the very rich live, uh, but you don't get the whole picture. And uh, part of the exercise of, of going around to all these different congressional districts is you do, you do get a better picture of America. So on Friday, February 14th, 1998, at 8 p.m. Alaska time, when I landed in Anchorage Airport, I chalked up my 435th congressional district. <laughs> now, But who's counting? Well, 
Uh, does this qualify for an entry on the Guinness Book of Records? Um, I don't know. I know of one young man who uh, seemed to be kind of indeterminate employment, but he came to see me, and he's now done all 435, he says. So uh, perhaps there are others out there. I have invited people to, if they want to join a 435 club, uh, we could do it. But uh, you do have to keep up when we have redistricting to make sure that you've been in all the boundaries of the new districts. Uh, I have been, by the way. I've checked it. Well, I, re I used to live in Manhattan, um, down on 22nd and 9th Street, and they had to redistrict the Upper West Side and the Lower West Side. Bella Abzug had the district below. They took the district up above and they made a, the district one block long until it got to her brownstone. Yeah. And clipped it there. Um, we're getting to districts like that, aren't we? Well, we're getting a fair lot of that around the country. I mean, there's been some complaints about redistricting. Um, there is a general lament that there are too many safe districts, safe for one party or the other, and the argument goes that you tend to elect um, people on the left and right wings of the two major parties and not very many people in the center when you have safe districts. That's true, isn't it? Uh, it tends to be true. What we've had is not a partisan redistricting, but bipartisan redistricting. Uh, in California, uh, Illinois, uh, New York, um, and, and to a certain extent Ohio in this cycle, you had bipartisan redistricting, which was largely incumbent protection time. They lost two seats in New York, and the oldest Democrat and the oldest Republican in the delegation got the heave ho. Uh, but it, uh, it was bipartisan, and um, there simply aren't. Uh, in those four states, which have over 100 congressional districts, nearly a quarter of the House, there aren't any seriously contested elections um, in this cycle. Isn't that, I, I think the figure is at, at most there are 20, 20 percent of House seats could be contested in a, well, isn't that bad for the, for It's our bad, but I think it's curable by the ordinary workings of the political process. If you, because the different alignments that we have, you know, this neighborhood being Democratic, this area being Republican, this demographic group being marginal, they tend to change over time. Within the 10-year intercensal cycle period, uh, you see shifts in voting population. So I can show you uh, districts in California that were considered marginal or leaning Republican at the beginning of the in the 1992, when the 1990 cycle redistricting went into effect, and which by 2000 were safe Democratic. I can show you seats uh, in places like uh, Georgia, which were considered leaning Democratic at the beginning of the 90s cycle and were considered safe Republican, because alignments change. We're in a period now where the alignments haven't changed very much. Since about 1996, 1998, we haven't seen very much movement, and the polls in this election to date seem to show be very similar to the breakdown of the 2000 presidential election. We had three House elections running where the popular vote was 49 percent Republican, 48 percent Democratic. Um, so that division hasn't changed, but someday it will. I don't know when. I've looked for the statistics because I like to be among the first or among mm -hmm. the first to spot them uh, as part of my job. But uh, they, they will sooner or later. We'll see some groups shift one way and some groups shift another way and seats that used to be safe won't be safe anymore. But what about the impact on the political discourse? As you mentioned, uh, in those, quote, safe districts, the challenges from the, either the left in the Democratic Party or the right in the Republican Party. And by the time folks get to Washington, it seems as if they, they are playing to their bases and, and not the moderate middle. Well, that's true to some extent. Um, it's actually what a lot of political scientists have been calling for for years, for decades. You know, I mean, you know the political science profession. They said we ought to have, uh, you know, looking at the Congress in the 1960s and the 70s when the Democratic Party was split between liberals from the North and conservatives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from the South, and there was something of a similar split in the Republican Party uh, between Midwestern conservatives and, you know, East Coast uh, moderates or liberals. Uh, and a lot of political science said, wouldn't it be better and more coherent if we had a political system in which uh, both parties stood for some clear set of issues instead of being an alliance of people with different points of view? So the voters could make a choice, and then the parties, the one that won the majority in Washington, could do its will legislatively, and you'd have responsive government. Well, guys, that's what we got now. 
and of course people don't like it. Well, <laughs> um, the political scientists like to be critical of what <laughs> is current, for what, but of course they left out the problem in the Senate where you need 60 votes these days for almost anything. Yeah, um, and that's, uh, you know, that's become particularly polarized and we've seen escalation of that in recent years. Before we close, okay. Uh, this might be a question just for me, but I hope our audience wanted to hear it too. So many of us had our first introduction to you as a, as a living, breathing, talking person on the McLaughlin Group. Ah. Oh, you're already practicing. So do you guys, what can you tell us behind the scenes? Do they rehearse that shouting at each other? Well, I don't do that program anymore. I appear on Fox News Channel frequently. Um, the, um, no, I mean, you don't rehearse it beforehand. And in fact, that sort of thing doesn't work if you really dislike the people. Mm -hmm. um, the, the show doesn't work. The edge becomes too hostile. And, ah, and, the and, secret is out. And the viewers don't, don't really like it. But yeah, occasionally uh, one gets genuinely uh, you know, engaged uh, in, in the argument and so forth. And uh, I don't like to be interrupted. <laughs> I've done that a few times today. On that note, Michael Barone, thank you very much for being on Policy Watch. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.